Um, I've been asked to talk about the legislation that's going through the House. Um, this is pretty much in flux because it's happening right now. So by the time I say it, it may not still be accurate. We'll see. Um, so just an overview of the, the legislation of, the, of C45. There are two bills, C45, the Cannabis Act, and C46, which makes consequential changes to the criminal code with respect to the impaired operation of a conveyance. Um, C45 sets the general criminal framework for cannabis, identifying what activities are legal and what remain prohibited. This is not just straight up legalization. There's still a lot of pieces that are not legal in terms of protecting youth, in terms of carrying over certain amounts and so on, um, and, and supplying cannabis. It provides for licensing and oversight of a legal cannabis supply chain that gives the Minister of Health, that's the Federal Minister of Health, the authority to license production, and it recognized the provinces and territories authorization to control the sale. So it'll work, um, the different jurisdictions have come up with different ways of rolling out the sale of cannabis, um, ranging from government control to private, but that's within their authority. But the basic rules in terms of um, the production, seed to sale, and so on, that's all in the fe federal regulations. This is primarily to protect public health and public safety. The argument that the government has used is that what we've done in the past isn't working, it's time to try something else. So the purpose of the Cannabis Act, as has been stated by many politicians who are doing this, is to protect the health of young persons by restricting access to cannabis, um, trying to reduce uh, inducements to use it, to provide for legal production of cannabis, that is a quality product so that you're not getting um, medical issues from, from product that may, for example, have pesticides on it deter illegal activities through appropriate sanctions and enforcement, reduce the burden on the criminal justice system. So C45 has tiered responses. So if you violate the rule, but just a little bit, that's a fine. If you go well over the rule, that's a criminal charge. But that will reduce the number of cases going to criminal court. As I said, it provides quality controlled supply um, there's a whole public awareness on the health risks of cannabis and public awareness on the, on the drinking and, or smoking and driving uh, use. It limits the promotion of sponsorship, much the way they do for tobacco now. Um, there are, as I said, there are ticketing options for minor infractions. If you're over the 30 milligrams of cannabis, but under 50, that's a ticket. If you go over 50, you get to meet a very nice police officer and a judge and the whole bit. There's seed to sale tracking, much like we do with food. So if there's a problem with production or chemicals that have been used, we'll be able to track it and withdraw it. And there are inspections and administrative monetary penalties. These are for suppliers. It's not necessarily going to be a criminal charge, an AMP, is essentially a monetary fine. It, it's a lot like a speeding ticket. Um, so the rules, which have changed a little bit since then, but um, over the 18, you can have 30 grams of licit dried cannabis in a public place. It's a, it's a criminal offense to distribute with or to youth. Um, there's a household limit four, I think it's now five plants, but it's one of the issues now before the, uh, the Senate is whether the province can change that or not. Certainly one province has indicated that they don't intend to allow that. Um, adults will be permitted to make their own cannabis products with some processing restrictions. Youth possession of up to five grams is non-criminal, so youth are not allowed to have any. So up to five grams, it's a fine. Over five grams, it's going to be criminal. Promotion is limited to where it is not seen by youth. And it, it can brand identify, but that's pretty much all of it. As I said, it's a lot like 
the way we did tobacco many years ago. Um, the, these are minimums. The federal government, in many cases, has set the minimums. If provinces want to make tougher laws, they can, but they cannot go below the minimum. C46 amends the criminal code related to convenient conveyances. Everybody thinks about drinking and driving or drugs and driving, but the criminal code has always covered all motor vehicles. This includes planes, boats, trains, and apparently now canoes. <laughs> Drug impaired driving has been a criminal offense since 1925. Since 2008, the code has authorized standardized field sobriety tests to assess drivers on the road and drug recognition evaluators at the station to replace an approved instrument for alcohol. Many jurisdictions and many more are adding them as we go forward. We'll have administrative programs for addressing a drug impaired driver similar to the way they do for alcohol. C46 allows for mandatory breath testing of drivers. Currently, a police officer must have suspicion that you have alcohol on board and you're driving before they can pursue an investigation. This came up in a court case two days ago where the um, uh, driver who was over the legal limit had the charges, um, I guess, defeated on appeal because the officer had no right to demand the sample, even though in the sample she was over 80. Mandatory breath testing would change that. The officer does not need a suspicion. The officer can ask you at any time because they currently have the right to stop you at any time. They have the right to stop you and ask for a breath sample. Note this is alcohol only. And there's a, what sounds like a small change, but it's bigger than, than it sounds. It changes the limit. The limit currently is you have to be over 80. The new limit will be 80 or over. Because of the way the rounding rules work in the equipment, that is a much more significant change than it sounds. The purposes of C46, first of all, C46 has two main parts, part one and part two. Part one is about cannabis, and as you can see here, it amends the code to create new offenses and authorize the police to use new investigative tools to better detect, detect drivers who are operating the vehicle while impaired by cannabis or other drugs. In the Canada Part 1 that Justice Canada put forward, there were 10 drugs and cutoffs listed in that. Uh, the three new offenses are listed here, but essentially if you're at two nanograms but less than five nanograms, um, that's a summary conviction and a fine. Um, there's a hybrid offense, which is essentially the way uh, impaired driving charges go forward now. If you have more than five nanograms, now this is all in blood. The two nanograms, the five nanograms are in blood. If you have more than five, then it's a straight up impaired conviction. There's a hybrid offense now for the combination of drugs and alcohol. 2.5 nanograms in blood of THC and uh, 50 milligrams of alcohol is a criminal offense as well. Before anyone asks me why the first one is 2 nanograms and the second one is 2.5 nanograms, I have no idea. But functionally, it makes very little difference. As I said, this applies to other impairing drugs, and in fact, the list uh, of 10 drugs that was included, included cannabis, but others like uh, cocaine and other drugs. An important point to what Doug was talking about, when you do legislation, when you put it in legislation, it's more powerful, but if you want to change it, it takes a very long time. It, it effectively is an act of parliament. So what they've done is they've put these in regulation. That means it's much simpler and quicker to change. It's not easy, but it's doable. It's a simply an order in council. So they can go forward to the government, say, we want to change this. The order in council comes through, and it's changed. And it does not have to go back to parliament. Part two of um, C46. The, the criminal code sections on impaired driving have been around for a long time. 
there is more common law cases about impaired driving than any other uh, criminal offense. All of those changes over time have made this very confusing. So essentially what we did was we threw out the old code and just rewrote it. One of the changes is that it used to be in um, personal injury section. It's now its own section in the code. So, and it modifies and sim simplifies the provisions. It makes the offenses and penalties more coherent. It eliminates, eliminates or restricts some common law defenses like bolus drinking. Um, it raises maximum penalties, authorizes mandatory screening by police. Um, and for those of you who have been following the Senate, you'll know that the Senate is recommending currently that that be removed. The Justice Minister has indicated that she is not receptive to that amendment. It simplifies the proof of the BAC uh, based on the technology, and it clarifies disclosure agree uh, arrangements. There are a lot of time spent in court um, where lawyers go fishing looking for all kinds of disclosure. So this says, this is what you're allowed to have. If you want more, you need to make an application to a court and convince a judge that you have to do it so that it'll use less court time and yet less police time. Um, there is a recognition and declaration up front. It essentially says, um, this is what Parliament intended. This is not open for discussion by judges. This is what Parliament wanted. The last one is the most important in terms of the drugs, and it says that an evaluation conducted by the, an approved officer using a reliable method is a valid measurement. There have been a lot of cases where there's been issues in court. This is Parliament trying to assert its authority, saying, we believe in this, we've looked at the science, and if, if you've done this, then you're guilty. There's drug screening. Um, there will be devices that are being approved, hopefully at some point, for roadside oral fluid screening. The one thing you have to remember is the oral fluid screening is measuring THC in oral fluid. The code relates to THC in blood. And there's not an easy conversion back and forth. So you'll see that the oral fluid levels have been set higher than it is in blood. You can see that the screeners will test for THC, cocaine, for, and amphetamine. Um, the standards have been developed. Um, they're now going through the process of trying to get uh, devices approved for use by police, and then they'll be training. There are hybrid offenses. The first part doesn't change a lot from what was there before. Um, in terms of prohibitions for impaired and refused, the first one doesn't change again. The big one is the second one, the ineligibility for interlock. So if you're a first offense, you can get an interlock and back on the road as quickly as a province can have this installed in your vehicle. That's a change. For, for a second offense, they've reduced the time by half, and for a third offense as well. There's also an issue about, uh, with the consent of the Crown, getting a treatment. This replaces the old curative discharge parts of the, of the code. So the next steps. C45 was at the Senate uh, on June the 7th. It reported back with 46 amendments. They will go back to the House. I believe the government has already said that they support 29 of those amendments. The jury's out and all the rest. They've, um, we don't know what they're going to do. The House is scheduled to rise somewhere between the 11th and the 22nd. So whether the government will move this forward in the House at this time, we don't know. Once the House is finished, if they don't accept all the amendments, it has to go back to the Senate to consider what the changes are. Clause by clause on C46 has finished. There were seven amendments and one observation made. Four of the amendments were technical and not, but will likely go ahead. Two of the amendments had to do with racial profiling, and there was one other one, and as I said, the, um, the amendment that they wanted to put forward about mandatory alcohol screening likely won't survive. This bill now has to go to third reading, and then it goes back to the House and goes through the same process. The bills will have to have royal assent. Health Canada has said they need 12 weeks after the act passes before it, it could be 
it likely will be proclaimed to give everyone time to get ready. C-46 Part 1 comes into uh, force on Royal Ascent. As soon as it passes and there's Royal Ascent, the three new charges are available. Um, part 2 has 180 days after proclamation. That's because there's a lot of work primarily on the part of the police in the provinces to get ready for the new numbering, the training, and all of that. Drug screeners need to be approved by the Attorney General, so there are a number of, of suppliers that have applied. It's going through the process now. What remains to be seen is when the testing by NRC, the National Research Council, will be done, and when they'll recommend to the Attorney General what to approve. And there's a lot of additional training. They want to increase SFST trained officers, DRE trained officers, and there'll be um, training required to use the oral fluid screening devices roadside because that's going to be all pretty new. And most of that is being supported by funds from public safety.